Uh, welcome. Uh, today is June 22nd, 2016, and we are in Berlin at the 20th International Movement Disorder Congress. And uh, my name is Steve Frucht, and to my left here is my mentor and colleague and close friend, Paul Green. And it's a real privilege uh, for me to uh, interview Paul today for the Movement Disorder Society archives. Uh, I'm honored to do so. So, And possibly even a pleasure. Uh, possibly even a pleasure, yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, although we have a script, <laughs> Which I not promise gonna <laughs> we're not gonna follow that. Um, but I would, also from my own curiosity, because I've never asked these questions, I would very much like to hear how you got interested in neurology and then ended up getting interested in movement disorders and taking that path way back when. I'm happy to answer that, but I, I wanna do one thing first. Okay. Because hopefully they won't edit this out, and I, this is for my children. I wanna okay. talk about my time before becoming a doctor. Excellent. So I, my parents were professional communists, and um, they were leaving the Communist Party around the time I was 10, which And they was were, this is in, in uh, New York. In New York, and where in New York did you grow up? Well, I was born uh, at Beth Israel in the Lower East Side. I yes. lived on 12th Street in a railroad flat. And what avenue? I don't remember, I think second. Right, okay. Uh, it was second or third, I, I don't remember now. Right. It's been a while. And then the party sent my parents to East Harlem, where there were two other Jewish families. My, my parents were professional communists. My father was one of the best administrators the party had in this country. But in the old country, they would have been professional Jews. That's what he did. Uh, burial societies, uh, sports teams, uh, and insurance companies, that was his thing. So he was a, really a professional Jew. So they sent this Jewish Eastern European family to East Harlem where there were where you two. you fit right in. We fit right in. <laughs> there were two other Jewish families, one down below us, and then a black family, black Jewish family across the street. And what street was that on? 98th and Lexington, about five blocks from where you work. And where you work. And where I work. In so the you've come, full, you've come full, full circle. Full circle, and yeah. Ruth is thinking about moving back into the project. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but everything else has changed. It's so dramatic. Yeah. So I, I was, uh, the oldest son of the most famous man no one ever heard of, because on the East Coast, every communist knew my father. Really? He, well, he ran the summer camp, Kinderland, Lakeland. This is the Jewish communist summer camp, and he was a big shot in the insurance this was, company. This was in the period before or after McCarthy? This is during McCarthy. During McCarthy. Yeah. So he must have received a lot of uh, uh, well, pressure. it's a little bit more complicated. Oh. Actually, he officially left the party in 1945 to become the liaison between the underground Central Committee and the official Central Committee. I see. So when people, during the McCarthy era, we would have people living in our living room who were trying to escape McCarthy on their way to, they usually went out through Mexico to Poland. Oh my goodness. We had the Red Rabbi living in our... Wow who then went on to become a uh, typesetter for the New York Times oh. <laughs> and deserted his wife and children. I mean, it was, they were teenagers, you know? Yeah. I, you may not know, I don't know. Anyway, so, <clears throat> so I was uh, uh, the poster child for uh, Oedipus, and anything I thought my father was good at, I, I was unable to do. I, I had not a very realistic uh, appreciation for what my father, I always thought my father was an intellectual, but he wasn't, he was a, a top flight administrator. So I went into mathematics, because he was not good at mathematics, and I was good at mathematics. This is in high school? In high school, at Stuyvesant. Oh, so you went to Stuyvesant? Yeah. Ah. So you were born at Beth Israel, but then Stuyvesant was on one block away, 15th yes, and Yes, but that's day. not where I was living. Right. <laughs> so you had to travel all the way down. You took right? the subway down, and then the, I forget what it was, the, you know, that little line with one stop right. across. And so, uh, so I um, got very depressed, and I was an, I, I've always been an isolate. And, um, and then I went to MIT, and when I first got to MIT, it was like being reborn. 
really. Oh, first of all, I didn't have to eat Ashkenazic food, right? My mother had the, the prime possession of her life was a pressure cooker. <laughs> and everything went in the pressure cooker, including the canned vegetables. And, and you know when the chicken was done, when you could stick a fork through it, bones and all. I had never actually tasted a fresh vegetable th since, until I went to college. I, uh, I, I was always a night person, and I was in the dorm the first year, the first semester, and uh, I could never, the only food that was decent was breakfast, and I, I would never get up on time to have breakfast, so I moved off campus and I got an apartment, and I did my own cooking. It was just, it was just wonderful. And, um, and then I, I had taken all of the uh, first and second year courses at Stuyvesant, so when I first got there, I did whatever I wanted. I took uh, Russian, I took music, I took, uh, I took a class in the Spanish Civil War with Noam Chomsky. So this Chomsky. was in, in what year, what years was this? 63 to 67. So this is when Chomsky was sort of at his peak. peak. Absolutely. Right. Did and you know him? Did you? Yes. Yeah. They had an anti-war petition, and uh, I was the one who carried it to the New York Times, and, and Ch <laughs> you have to understand what things were like in those days. Chomsky was saying, you know, you understand, you might end up in jail if you do this. I'm in jail for carrying a petition to the New York Times. Anyway, so yeah, it, he was, we started the MIT Socialist Club. We had, uh, we had, this was, they were integrating the schools in Boston just right. around that time. So there right. were lots of demonstrations. We organized a anti-apartheid demonstration. People would come up to us on the street and say, boy, we haven't seen a political demonstration like this since the Depression. I mean, it was heady times. Yeah. And then um, in my, well, by my fourth year, I was severely depressed. I spent most of my fourth year in a dark room. Um, and I, I basically, over two weeks before finals, <laughs> I, I studied and passed everything. Uh, and then I went to graduate school because I was a good Jewish boy. You know, that's what Jewish boys are supposed to do. But the, um, at MIT, I was 15 when I got to MIT, there were, oh, I was a competent mathematician. There were maybe three or four other people that were at my level. Then there were two who were brilliant and then one wunderkind. Right. And if I couldn't be the best, I wasn't going to do it. So I right. dropped out. I worked for something called the Students for a Democratic Society, which was... So you, you mean graduate school in mathematics? Yeah. At MIT? No, I was in, in Michigan. In Michigan? I, 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 no, in Wisconsin, University Wisconsin. of Wisconsin. Ah, okay. So uh, pure my, math. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is there any other I mean, not, not the applied math. No, 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 no. no. I know, nothing applied for me. So how long were you there? I was there for one semester. And uh, I had a little office because I was a, you know, a a teaching assistant, and uh, you may not remember this, but uh, they blew up a, a, a military, there was a, a educational military building, and they blew it up, and my office was right at, at the interface between the math building and that building, and my office was destroyed. Oh my goodness. And they blew it up, and I, I spent many nights in my office. If I'd spent the night there, I would have been killed. Oh so I was just very lucky <laughs> to be alive. Anyway, I, I dropped out. Um, I broke up with my first girlfriend. I got very depressed. And were your parents upset about that? My parents were upset with me pretty much from the time I dropped out. <laughs> I so, so that this was just the prelude. Yeah, yeah. this is just the prelude. Okay. Um, and so um, at, at college, and I was this shy kid, you know. I, I would have been a yeshiva bakr if it had been the old country. And, uh, uh, and they, all the Jews were on one floor at MIT. I'm sure it was not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. um, but there were other people on the floor, and there was one guy whose father was some kind of professor at um, Cornell, and, and he grew up in Ellis Holler, New York, and he taught me how to hitchhike. And so uh, I hitchhiked to California, and I became From a Wisconsin. From Wisconsin. So this is like 68. Eight. 68. Right. And then, unbeknownst to me, uh, I was drafted. And, oh, uh, they sent it to your home address. They sent it to my home address. And my roommates didn't know where I was because I didn't have an address. And I just happened to come upon one of them one day in Berkeley. And he told me that I'd been drafted. So I went to San Francisco to turn myself in. And, um, and so I went to, I was going to refuse induction, of course. And I went there to the entrance. And uh, I told the guy who I was. I was there to be inducted, 
and I, I had this file about <laughs> this. Just on you. Just on me. And instead of sending me to all the other people, he sent me to a separate room where it was just people who were going to refuse induction. And so we did that. And then something astonishing and bizarre happened. I, um, I had a lawyer. They were, they were free lawyers for people who were refusing induction. And, and we went to court. And there were so many draft refusers that this went on for a year. And every couple of weeks we'd go, and the, the draft boards would get these requests for information from the courts. And the information was about draft dodgers. And so they thought that they would drag their heels and not provide the information. And so I would go there, and my lawyer would get up and say, Your Honor, um, I request a continuance. I have requested the following documents from the, and as of such and such a date, I have not received anything. And so we would, I would go every, you know, about two to three times a month, I would go. And, I had two judges die while I was waiting. And finally, at the end of the year, he said, all the documents are here. All our appeals have been denied. Pack your toothbrush. So I got really stoned the night before and came there. And at this time, there were so many people getting off in San Francisco that they appointed a federal prosecutor to stand in at these trials. And my prosecutor was a woman who had run for superior court in San Francisco and lost. And um, everyone loved her. And so my lawyer gets up and s says, he, I won't give you all the details, but he, he makes a, uh, a claim that we knew was invalid. And this woman says, OK, we'll let you off. And this federal prosecutor interrupts her and says, Your Honor, that was decided a year ago in such and such a court. And the judge turns to this guy and he says, How dare you interrupt her? She may not be able to release him, but this is my court. I can do whatever he, I want, case dismissed. And I walked out and I was able to throw away my toothbrush and I never ended up in jail. Wow. Yeah. And so I did my thing. Thing, you know? And what were you doing in this year when you were? I was walking around Berkeley barefoot by myself, completely isolated in this tiny little apartment above a garage, ah. selling the Berkeley bar, panhandling. I would sit next to restaurants, and when people left some food on their plates, I would go and eat it. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, for years, at some point at Columbia, I, I got embarrassed because these people would come up to you and say, well, I want. Money. I, I need twenty dollars to get gas for my car to go to New Jersey, and you know they'd be there for weeks on end. And I was sort of embarrassed, so I stopped giving them money. You know, you don't want to feel like a fool. And then, a couple of years ago, I um, I, I don't know what the trigger was, but I, I realized this was ridiculous. You know, if that had happened to me, where would I be? So now I, I start. I try to give away at least five or six dollars a week. You know, I give out a, a dollar every. Yes. I give out two dollars. I have two dollars in my back pocket, and I give them to people who are banging. So I feel makes me feel better. So your parents found out about this. That my you parents were... didn't know the details. Oh. Probably best. Probably best. Yeah. One time I was hitchhiking back, and you know I would get stuck. I got stuck in Denver once, and I got a, a driveway beer truck. And you know how beer trucks are—you've got these little uh, cubicles, you know, for the beer kegs. And so we were driving to to um, L.A. And we would pick up hippies who were hitchhiking. Each one had their own little cubicle. And it, well, we picked up one black guy who had been attacked and beaten up. And they, they shaved his head. He was febrile. He was sick. And we dropped him off and watched. We, we get to LA, and it's night. And uh, we're driving along, and there's a police car behind us. And uh, he's following us. We, we didn't do anything wrong. And then six more cars pulled up. They pull us over. They all have their guns drawn. It's illegal to drive a beer truck at night in LA. Ah. But we have the paperwork. We show them the paperwork, and we drive off. And we drive a little ways, 10 minutes, and the same thing happens. And so we show them the paperwork, and then we say, well, would you call ahead to the next precinct and just let them know? They refused. <laughs> so we had to this do this. This happened over Every and over. Every precinct. <laughs> it was really funny. I mean, we got used to it by that time. I had picked a little flower up in the mountains, you know, when we crossed the, and they found it. They thought it was pot, but oh. it wasn't, unfortunately for them and luckily for me. 
Um, it was, uh, it was, uh, it, it was horrible for me at the time, but they're great stories, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well. And then, and then I, 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 I took. Mo I was mostly pot, but I did a, a fair amount of LSD and you know other stuff, and that's what saved my life. Having LSD was like opening a door, you know. All this suppressed anger came out, and I, I rejoined the human race. And, well, uh, but this this was also the late '60s, so this was this not the late uncommon. 60s. No, this is not uncommon. Not uncommon at all. Oh, I was living with runaways from Texas and dropouts from New York, and it was uh, the way that it's a heady existence. Heady existence. That's right. Uh, how how did you get at? What happened then? Well, I came back east. Uh, I had. I'm allergic to dust, and and I, my parents paid my tuition at MIT, but I paid all the expenses, so I worked during the year, and then I worked during the summers. And uh, the first semester I worked in the library, which was great. I loved it. I worked in the reserve book, book room. I had the, I don't know, the 11 to 4 shift or something. I don't remember. And it was great. That's what I liked to be up. And there was nobody there. And I got to do my homework and read. But the next year, they put me in the stacks, which I, I really enjoyed. I could identify every journal by the color. But I, it was just I couldn't breathe. It was terrible. So I went to an upperclassman. I said, you know, I need to make money. What should I do? He said, learn programming. So they had an IBM 7094, you know, and you would do your cards, and it didn't work, and you'd take it back and figure out what was wrong and submit your cards again. And uh, I took co co computer science one uh, and computer science two, and then I passed myself off as a programmer. And I worked that summer for Cyrus Leventhal. Um, this was the Cold War. Right. And so uh, the Office of Naval Research, you have to understand if you're a government agency, you have to spend all your money, otherwise you don't get as much next year. So they were funding. Now, just to interrupt, they, they didn't have a problem with your background? They were you? funding Chomsky. Oh. They, were, they just wanted to get rid of the money. They didn't care oh. where they spent it. They okay. had to spend it. So I, I worked, and they were, I worked at night, and there were these armed guards that would patrol this naval building, you know, and they were, the, peop, the kids next door who were real programmers were um, programming the arm for the Mars rover. And I learned about programmers. You, they don't speak English. If you don't say exactly the right words, they, the context has no meaning for them. They are the most literal people that you'll ever meet in your life. And I was the world's worst programmer. I broke every rule of good programming. I didn't document my programs. They weren't modular, but they worked. I was a mathematician. I was working on three-dimensional reconstructions and, and anal uh, computerized analysis of x-ray crystallography data and stuff like that. So my programs worked. They were terrible, but they worked. So when I got back to New York, I, I worked as a programmer. And I could make, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a luxurious lifestyle. I, I would make enough in a year so I could not work for six months. So I would work, I'd take a job or two, and then I'd you know, live on what I made and then take another job. And there weren't that many mathematical programmers in those days. Now it, it would be impossible for me to work. But then I, went, I, I had a roommate, and uh, we met at an anti-war conference in Montreal uh, run by the separatists, the, ba ba the uh, French separatists. And uh, I had this, my, the person I was programming with was dating a girl in the Columbia housing office, so I got a faculty apartment ah. on Riverside Drive. What block? Overlooking Grant's tomb. Oh, I, so I, about 123rd. It was 124th, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was right below 125th. Right. And uh, it was this absolutely gorgeous apartment, you know, high ceilings, and I should have kept it. I, I gave it to some woman who was doing Dove research, and I, eventually I let it go. It was stupid. I'm, I'm not the world's best businessman, as you know. Um, as I was married there, we got married in my apartment. It was so oh my big. goodness. We had the ceremony. So had you already tomb. had you met Ruth at that point? Met Ruth shortly after coming back, yeah. after getting the apartment and coming back. And so I had a roommate, and we were doing sort of low-level jobs. And uh, we decided that, uh, being nice Jewish boys, we need to be professionals. So we flipped a coin. And he won, and he became a lawyer, and I lost, and I went to medical school. So, so that was the option. Yeah. One would become a doctor, and well, one would become a lawyer. After working for Cyrus Leventhal, I got interested in neurobiology. So uh. I, I, I went to graduate school in neurobiology. But I, I just had no patience. And where was where, where the graduate school? At, uh, at Yale. At Yale. Yeah. I, I moved to Yale to get Ruth to marry me. So she got a job as a technician in, um, uh, 
I forget her name, some famous lab. Her husband won a Nobel Prize. And, and I went to graduate school in neurobiology. And then I dropped out and I did what I usually do. I got a job programming, of course. And then um, I went to medical school. And so that decision, was it literally on the flip of a coin? Oh, yeah, we flipped the coin. <laughs> now, I, I had worked in a biology lab. I, as I said, you know, after working for programming for Cyrus, I did that. I took biology. And then um, after medical school, I, I... So this was at University of Connecticut. Right. You're in medical school, yeah. Right. And I came back, and I, I didn't know much. And I, Ruth got a job. At, Ruth went to graduate school at Einstein. So I, I looked for a, uh, an internship near Einstein, and I ended up at Bronx, Lebanon. Mm. Not the most prestigious place. And so you decided, when did you decide, you knew already that you were going to go into neurology going to University of Connecticut? Because of my experience with Because Levitol. of your experience. Right. Okay. And what was and your, the, what the, was the, your the neurology neurolog experience The neurologists at, at UConn were amazing. Really? They were, yes, they were self-taught neurologists. They'd been trained as internists, self-taught during the war. They were army docs. Um, and they were academically oriented. And it was a different world. And we, we would be in clinic. Uh, and um, Reich would see some patient and say, oh, you know, the, the residents have to see this. Walk this guy up to the floor and put him in a bed. <laughs> and that's what I did. I would, I would take him across the street, you know, walk him into the hospital, up to the floor, and down to the front desk and say, put this guy in a bed. And that was it. And that they was, would be admitted. They, would, they were admitted. <laughs> a different one. And, and they taught me. They, they, I mean, they were very bright guys. And they said, look, if you go into academic medicine, you're not going to make a lot of money. You're, you have these requirements. You're, you're expected to become uh, well-known in your field. You have to publish. You have to lecture. On the other hand, you get to follow your, what your interests. You, know, you get to do what you want. And that was right. my idea of academic medicine. And, um, and it was fortunately Fon's idea, too, which is why right. I stayed there for so long. In any case, I, I was doing Bronx Lebanon, and this unusual guy had just become chief resident. And, we transported a, a, you know, a guy in alcoholic coma for, for a CAT scan. We didn't have our own CAT scan. And we got started talking, and I talked about my mathematics background. And he, he, he wanted to show off. And to show off, he, he went to Schaumburg and had Schaumburg admit me to the residency program at Einstein, <laughs> despite the fact that I was coming from Bronx, Lebanon. So really? that's how I ended up being a, an intern and resident at Einstein. And then I had to decide what to do next. I, I, what was your experience like at Einstein? Because that was, that was a period where there were it was, some very, very prominent people within oh, neuropathology and pathology. Everywhere. This is before they dismantled Einstein. It was still a first-rate place. Yeah. Uh, we had world-famous people in almost everything except movement disorders, yeah. uh, and really excellent people. Uh, Scheinberg was crazy, but he was an incredibly brilliant guy. Yeah. Um, Schaumburg was, was brilliant. I mean, a lot of people were, they were excellent teachers. Um, it was a, a phenomenal experience for me. Um, and I, and I, I fleshed out things that I had learned in mathematics. I, I had learned things that my fellow residents, I was a lot older, that they didn't understand, which is that you, you get from people what they have to offer, not what you expect. And so, you know, um, there were people there who couldn't make therapeutic decisions, but they had love of physiology. And, and so I enjoyed that. And my fellow residents, they wouldn't treat the patients. All they wanted to do was treat the patients and move on. But it, it was kind of sad, I thought. Anyway, I, um, I worked at North Central Bronx as an attending for a year. And I decided general neurology was not for me. I mean, it was fun. but And then I had to choose a subspecialty. And so I figured, uh, you know, given my proclivities. I, have, I always had a terrible memory, but I was good at reasoning. I, I should pick something obscure, become a big fish in a small pond. So it was, the choice was between movement disorders and higher cortical function. I figured nobody was going into those, you know, who cared? There was no money to be made. And, um, and so I decided I chose movement disorders. And there, was there anyone there who did movement disorders? Not when I was there. And was was uh, Oliver well, Sacks move, around there? You, Oliver you, Sacks showed up rarely. Rarely, okay. Right. Yeah, but you did you did see him occasionally there. Right? Rarely, rarely. Okay. I don't shouldn't say this. I, yeah. I don't want to talk about Oliver yeah. Sacks. <laughs> but um, 
But did you have exposure, you had exposure to some movement disorder patients? At it's like every other resident. I had two Parkinson patients in my clinic. Right. Um, and um, I don't, the, the residents, uh, most of our residency was at Jacoby. Right. We spent a month or two with the private hospital in at Monty. Uh, but the, at Monty, the, we rarely took care of the private patients, so we almost never got to see movement disorders. Right. Um, I remember after Stan published his Artane paper, they had some, they, they thought adult torticollis was mostly psychogenic. Right. And they tried to treat, they have one or two kids, and they tried to treat them with Artane, and they gave them 10 milligrams of Artane, and they got sick as a dog, and they said, oh, this doesn't work, you know? Um, so it, it, when I got to Columbia, I, I knew absolutely nothing. So when, when you... About the, movement disorders. The application process, though, was very different than it is now, right? You just basically called up and... Oh, the application process was, uh, was quite simple. Uh, I, I talked to Stan, and he says, I see that you're a computer programmer. And that was all I needed. <laughs> oh. He took his sabbatical to write a, a, a computerized database. When I got there, uh, Bob Burke was the attending because right. Susan was on uh, maternity leave, and then Susan came back, and th that was it. He, he wanted a computer programmer, so so he wasn't me. even there when when you were interviewing. No, he was there when I was interviewing, but oh. he wasn't doing clinic. He was I programming. See. Right. Bob Burke was the attending, um, and um, it was me and Heidi Shale. Both of us knew almost nothing about movement disorders, as most residents do. They don't know much about movement disorders. And I'm not sure about this, but I think we may have been the first fellows of Stan to see patients on our own. And, and we owe a tremendous amount to the three of them, but they owe a bit to us because the, the potential for catastrophe was large. We answered all the phone calls. Um, we made the decisions for the patients over the phone. And, you know, Movement disorders is a heavily phone-oriented specialty yeah. because there's only so many hours in a day and you're dealing with this huge number of patients, very complicated treatment regimens. And the, the, you were seeing patients on the second floor of the NI at that point? Or? We saw patients all over. It was the second floor. We moved to, I think, the 12th floor at one time, which was empty. It overlooked the operating theaters and it was been completely abandoned and they didn't even clean it. There were no lights, and the floors were dirty. So it was perfect. We had a whole floor to ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, we in, would inject in the bathroom, and we would see You're patients. You're talking about Botox, right? Botox, yeah. yes. Um, and then we had one other floor, uh, which is where I really got to know Susan. We, we had J.P. Moore's old office, I think on the 13th floor, corner office. And uh, Susan, I had my computer, and Susan wrote her papers on paper and her rough drafts. And we had this huge office, and, and her drafts would be covering the floor. The, I couldn't walk to my desk because I had to tiptoe around the papers. And two or three times a day, I would hear this scream, oh my god, she couldn't find a page. A page was missing. So I forced her to learn how to use the computer and write her papers on computer. So we were all over that building before Stan renovated the third floor. Right. We would, we would see patients, and we saw patients till about six, and then we would go on rounds, because in those days, everybody with dystonia got put in the hospital. Automatic, really? oh, automatically. Uh, adults, children, didn't matter. They all had an extensive workup. And it was all done in-house? All done in-house. Uh, and we would keep them for two weeks, three weeks, no big deal, you know. Treat them with Artane, treat them with this, treat them with that. Um, and he was very lucky, because despite being totally ignorant, we were, we both knew our limitations well. You know, when we didn't know something, we knew when we didn't know, and so we didn't screw up much at all. Um, and our first research project was to figure out how to use botulinum toxin. Right. <laughs> and so this is 83? Something like that, 84, mm -hmm. maybe 83, 84. And, uh, and we were so naive. I mean, it's some of the things we did are embarrassing. For example, they told us that you do botulinum toxin and uh, you have the patients wait for an hour afterwards and do vital capacities to make sure they don't have botulism. Well, it takes 18 hours for the 
botched on toxin to get into the cell. Anybody who could have opened a journal and figured that out. But here we were having these patients sit there and, you know, doing vital capacities <laughs> every 15 minutes. It was pretty silly. Um, and they told us, oh, nobody gets antibodies. And so we, uh, we hadn't, and everybody was terrified of botulinum toxin. And so this is all with, this is all with, uh, you know, you're talking about five or six years before the approval. So this oh, is yeah. all IRB approved. That's right. Uh, protocols with the 7911. Alan, Alan uh, Scott would ship us these right. vials. And um, I love to tell your fellows, we paid uh, $60 for a vial of 100 units. And we paid, guess how much we paid for a vial of 500 units? $60. $60, that's right. right. The toxin is free. Right. So it's all in the shipping and delivery. It's the, it's the vacuum packing and the delivery and the vials and the rest of that. that a lot of toxin, when you divide the number of treatments, it's a, a fraction of a penny, right. I mean, a tiny fraction of a penny. So here we were, and, and they were doing, it was in nanograms then, it wasn't in units. And they were doing, you know, 10 nanograms or 20 nanograms for blepharospasm. We were terrified of this stuff. So we would start by giving people 20 nanograms, and of course not much happened. And we knew that it took at, at most about two weeks to take effect and you didn't have to worry about antibody. So we had our patients come back every two weeks. And that is an incredibly good way to learn how to do botulinum toxin because the muscles atrophy and you can then palpate the deeper muscles. Right. And so we were incredibly effective. I, I think those patients did, torticollis patients did better than any of the patients that we do now. And when they would come back at two weeks, you would inject them again? We would inject them again every yeah. two weeks. How many times would you do that? Um, we would do that uh, three or four times until we couldn't, there weren't any more muscles to palpate. <laughs> out of the first 20 patients, 18 became resistant. Right. And this is with the 7911 batch. 7911 batch, which was a terrible batch. Why right. Allergan bought that and packaged it, right. nobody ever knows. Eric that. Johnson has, has talked about that. And I, it's astonishing to me that they were never sued. Yeah. Anyway, we, we, learned a tremendous amount. I mean, it was absolutely the most incredible so you were injecting for, for blef, and you were injecting for... facial spasm, blef, and tort. And that, and that was it? No limb? We did no limbs okay. in those and days. And around that time, Andy Blitzer did the first right. vocal cord. Yeah. Andy did vocal cords, he did tongues. Yeah. Highly effective and incredibly toxic. Right. People would end up in the hospital on feeding tubes. And right. We stopped. Um, he must have done some. He did um, palatal myoclonus. Right. He did some pharyngeal injections. He showed us how to inject for anterocolis. You can get the anterior paraspinal muscles through the posterior pharynx. Unfortunately, every time you do that, there's a risk of the toxin leaking anteriorly and causing dysphagia. So right. we never did it. But it, it's actually easy, and it's not even all that painful. Right. Uh, doing you know, sweating is much more right. painful than that. We didn't do much of that in those days. We did one or two. Um, I discovered quite by accident that people with migraines, sometimes their headaches got better. I called up the headache clinic at Montefiore. I said, I have this great treatment for you. If you send me patients, I'll inject them. They didn't want to have anything to do with me. And, and this is in the mid 80s. Yeah. yeah. And I wasn't going to, you know, I, I, I did moonlighting in the headache clinic for money, and I didn't want to have anything to do with those patients. So. Right. If they weren't going to send me the patients, I was not going to start seeing headache patients, so I, I didn't do anything about it. Um, but we, we, you know, we just had all these accidents, and we learned just a tremendous amount. We had, we'd have these debates with Stan about whether um, the contraction, so most people with uh, adults with torticollis have a single um, direction. And yet, the muscles that cause turning in the opposite direction were obviously contracting. So, so we would debate with Stan whether this was compensatory contractions trying to you know, overcome the turning or whether this was part of the dystonia. Because if you read books about dystonia, the physiology is co-contraction of agonist and antagonist. Right. So we would have these debates. And then we decided enough was enough. And we were going to find out for ourselves. And there were no IRBs in those days. So we said, look, if we inject both sides of the neck, if it's compensatory, they'll get worse. And if it's part of the disease, they'll get better. So they got better. And so we took our data to stand and said, look, we were right. It's not compensatory. It's, 
you know, it's part of the disease. And so we, we would just, we just had a ball. It was exciting, we, 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 you know, every day we learned something new. Um, we had people with torticollis close their eyes and march in place, and, and often they rotated in the same direction as the torticollis, but sometimes they rotated in the opposite direction. When we first learned to, to inject blepharospasm, we were taught by the ophthalmologists, and they uh, used lid shields right. to keep from piercing the globe, and if you want to put a piece of plastic or metal over it, you have to anesthetize the cornea. 20% of our patients, their blepharospasm completely went away right. until the anesthetic wore off. We couldn't figure out a way to turn that into a treatment because if you permanently anesthetize it, you get ulcers and you become blind. You didn't, you didn't ever try uh, using lidocaine for the neck? We tried. The problem is it's, it's not the skin, it's not the needle piercing the skin that's the problem. It's, it's the toxin pushing aside normal muscle that's right. the burning. So you'd have to inject deep. For every site you were going to inject botulinum toxin, you'd have to inject lidocaine. So it would double the number of injections, and it was just not worth it, you know. Most people, uh, and, and what we did, we, we just concentrated. That if we had somebody that was particularly sensitive, we would concentrate the toxin, decrease the volume, and they didn't have as much pain. Um, it, it's the people who were afraid of needles that were the real problem, not, not the pain from the injection so much. And from that experience, you published papers about response, but then also development of antibodies and right. Well, it was what many would, it was would obvious because we would examine these people, and the SCM, you know, 20 units in most people it was gone, but certainly it would be flabby. 30 to 40 units, it was completely gone, and and. When the muscles came back, that was the time to re-inject, and we would re-inject, and they'd come back two weeks later, no change in the SCM. Right. And I went through the literature, there was only one possible explanation for that, and that was antibodies. And so I wrote it up, I submitted it to Annals, and they refused to accept it. So I've never, never submitted an <laughs> article to Annals after that. I, I went to everybody I could think of. I went to immunologists, they said, oh, too little protein can't be antibodies. I, I went to the CDC and they said, well, it can't be. We, there was this guy who, who died, unfortunately. He was, had a botulinum toxin lab. And he looked throughout the entire world for uh, antibodies, naturally occurring antibodies. He, he figured, well, the Eskimos must be, they eat blubber. They must be exposed to lots of botulinum toxins. So they looked well, among the Eskimos for, they couldn't find it. No one would believe me. And then, you know, the people that were doing botulinum toxin in, in um, in Austin and Chicago, I went there and I would tell them, you have to be really careful because people develop antibodies. It was 20% of our population over time, even with 200 units, you know, or 250 units. And they said, oh, we never see it. You know, Joe Jackman, oh, I never see it. Cindy Camell, I never see it. I I'm not sure why. It, you know, it's so often that people will come and say, you know, I didn't get quite the same response I had as last time. and then. It takes a while for them to develop, and, and the people who get no response go away. They don't come back. And I'm not sure why it took them so long to recognize it, but it, they just did. It just did. How did you make the decision to stay on after your fellowship at Columbia? I stand fun is here you had three astonishing people. Stan Fon has a lot of positive attributes, but he is the world's most amazing phenomenologist. And it, it just blew me away. Um, the second video rounds I walked into, he said, um, you know, here's, they were looking at a video, I was late, and uh, he said, is that a hemifacial spasm or a synkinesis? And I said, I don't know, which was the right answer, <laughs> of course. And so I was determined to learn, you know. Uh, he, he's the eternal optimist. I'm the eternal pessimist. So he would do all these clinical trials that I would never, in a million years, I, you know, I would have sat there thinking of a thousand reasons why they, they wouldn't work. But he would just plunge ahead and do it. And then Bob Burke had, was the, sort of the best reviewer, you know, next to Joe Jankovic, report of five cases in review of the world's literature. That's the Jankovic paper. And Susan was the world's best uh, diagnostician. I mean, how could you not want to be at a place like that? The m clinical material was phenomenal. Right. Uh, it, it was, and, and Stan really valued clinical research. Yeah. How, how, 
why would anybody leave? And then probably the next area that for people watching this that they know about your involvement was then the, the fetal transplant right. trial, uh, <laughs> which we don't have to talk about if you would rather how not. How much time <laughs> is there? Well, probably not enough. But, um, but maybe briefly you can just... Well, this is another study that I was sure was not going to work. Okay. I was actually surprised when people got better. Um, I almost lost my license because what happened was that um, the people who improved after, many people didn't improve with the fetal transplant. Uh, e even the, the people who got the transplant, we, we didn't know who had the transplant. The first year we didn't know, it was a, it was a double blind study. And we knew which, plant, which grafts worked and which didn't from the, later from PET scans. And even people whose grafts worked and produced dopamine didn't always get better. And some of the people didn't get better, the grafts didn't survive. But here were this small group of people who would come back for their you know, th every three month visit and their dyskinesias were worse. And so we did what you always do when dyskinesias are worse, you lower the sentiment. And they did well. So we thought they were doing great. And they would come back three months later, their dyskinesias were worse again, and we'd lower the sentiment again, and uh, we thought it was great. And it was just about a year when the first couple of patients hit zero and the dyskinesias were still worse. And that's when I realized that we were having trouble. And so I submitted this to the FDA and they said, why didn't you notify us before? But we didn't think of this as an adverse event. We thought of it as great. Right, and of so, engraftment and needing less dopamine. Right. We thought it was fantastic. You know, we didn't think of it as an adverse event. And I, I think the only reason why they didn't, they threatened to pull my license, the only reason they didn't was because they would have had to do something to Stan, and he was such a big shot, they, they didn't think they could get away with it. Uh, because I didn't keep it a secret. I mean, I, you know, all of us, the, anybody who was involved in the study knew about this. And I had presented it, at, at, it was hardly like I kept it a secret. You know, right. I presented it at meetings. Um, and that's when, um, we realized that we had a real problem on our hands. Right. And, you know, the, the, the pattern of the dyskinesias was a little atypical and corresponded to what showed up on the PET scans. You know, people who had one-sided predominant release of dopamine from the graft, their dyskinesias would be highest on the other side. Right. And they looked just like dopa dyskinesias, and that's why we, we hypothesized every time we presented this that these were uh, coming from production of uncontrollable production of dopamine by the graft. The people who devoted their lives to grafts needed to come up with an alternative explanation. That's where this serotonin hypothesis came from. And, you know, I mean, it's okay as a hypothesis, but the clinical data certainly pointed towards this being a dopaminergic effect. And so that's what I said at meetings. Now, before we run out of time, I do want to uh, make sure that we sort of get, you know, you and I have many conversations, frank conversations about not only the meaning of life, but like the meaning of neurology and oh, what, people, what people are interested in and why they go into it and the future of our field. And so I, I would like to get oh, yes, your comments absolutely. on this, so, as, as, uh, particularly for our specialty. For well, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You mean, you mean uh, whether we should elect Trump or, or Clinton? No, we know, we know, uh, neither of that, you know. <laughs> uh, so, so I've done a lot of thinking about this, um, and I, I have no idea where, what direction our field should take, but, but this meeting here has consolidated what I've been thinking for a long time. So you have genetics has revolutionized diagnosis in our field and threatened phenomenology unbelievably, you know, uh, because there's so much overlap in these syndromes that using phenomenology as a key to diagnosis is, is evaporating rapidly. It's, it's still useful for treatment, you know. If somebody's blepharospasm is part of a tick, it's a, the treatment's different than if it's part of dystonia. But in terms of diagnosis, um, it has revolutionized diagnosis. Occasionally, you have biochemical defects with uh, uh, presentations that we didn't expect, and so there, 
Uh, genetics will give you a clue as to treatment. Right. But, but aside from that, genetics has not yet uh, uh, yielded much advance in treatment. People are hoping to use genetic treatments. In other words, if you have a gain of function mutation, the hope is that you can use genetics to, inter to block that. And if you have a loss of function mutation, use genetics to replace the missing element. But at this point in time, I think it's impossible to know whether that will work for all diseases, genetic diseases, some genetic diseases, or no genetic diseases. I think each of those three is equally possible. Um, and it makes a tremendous difference, because if it only works for some or none of the genetic diseases, then what you have to fall back on is dealing with the, the biochemical disturbance. And unlike genetics, where, where one lab fits, one, one size fits all, you know, any lab can do genetics for any disease, there, every single biochemical defect, you need a different lab. And so it's much more labor intensive. You'd have to have a, a huge network of labs and apportion out the diseases according to the particular disturbance of that gene. And so that would then become the future of movement disorders. So for the next couple of years, the focus is going to remain on genetics, not just for diagnosis, which is obviously a, a, a windfall, but also for treatment. It, are there ways to replace things? Are there ways to block things? And I just don't, I can't tell from the existing literature whether that will be successful or not. But if it's not, we're back to hard work and, you know, doing the, the lab work for each individual biochemical disturbance. Um, and that, that's quite a chunk to chew on. Do you think that, um, you know, I'll, I'll ask a question that I think I know the answer to. So do you think Five. that, <laughs> do you think that, um, there will always be a role for astute clinical phenomenology in movement disorders? Well, people in our generation find it impossible to answer that no. I mean, can you even imagine movement disorders without phenomenology? I can't imagine. Well, not me, imagine. but. Can you imagine? Really? No. I can't. I can't. My fear is that it's going to become like other medical specialties, you know. You're a cardiologist, you biopsy. You biopsy the heart, you biopsy the kidneys, you do this scan, you do that scan. And we're heading in that direction, I think, in movement disorders. I, I'm not sure how important phenomenology is going to be 20 years from now. It, it's hard for me to imagine. It's painful because I get such joy, you know, in, in looking at the face and every single muscle and every square <laughs> inch. And, but I, I'm not sure that it has a future, unfortunately. I, mean, I, I would think it's said, You know, I'm an Eastern European Jew. That culture has disappeared. I mean, those people, if you lived to be 30, you were lucky, they were poor, they were discriminated against. In some ways, it's great that that's gone. On the other hand, the culture went with it, you know? Right. Uh, you read uh, Moby Dick. It was a horrible life, and yet there's this culture, human culture, complex human culture that's gone forever. Every time a human culture disappears, you have to be at least a little bit sad, even if it's an advance and people's lives are better. And I, I, my fear is that the same is going to be true for phenomenology. What do you think that will mean for fellowship training for, for young people? It's going to be like nephrology and cardiology. You learn a lot of, you know, how to talk to geneticists and how to read scans and, you know. I think it's, uh, it'll be sad. I mean, I hope I'm wrong, but my fear is that I'm not. And I think I would be remiss <laughs> if I didn't at least give you the chance to rail against <laughs> the economics of healthcare for at least five minutes. I won't, I won't. You know, you know. I will rail against no matter what the course of, of academic, of, of clinical research is, whether it's phenomenology based or not. I, I, th I can't imagine a world of medicine without clinical research. And, and in the United States, they're disassembling all of the major clinical research centers. It's easy to disassemble a center and incredibly difficult to put it back together again. That, I think, is a real catastrophe. Um, loss of phenomenology is sad, but not a catastrophe. That is a catastrophe. If you're sick and you can't find a doctor, you're upset and you, tell, you call your senator. 
but if you don't have clinical research, you don't realize it for 10 years. And so I, I just think it's calamitous. Um, genetic research, laboratory research, high yield, you're guaranteed to get results. I understand why money pours into that, and I don't object to it, but you're going to need clinical research. You really are, and it's, it's a catastrophe that they are disassembling those. And doctors make terrible businessmen, as we both know, yeah. and having money-oriented hospitals is just a catastrophe. I don't object to people in private practice. Good, you know, more power, but you need to have centers where prestige and novelty and pub publishing are the goals and not making money. And the people do that. People will, you know, are, are just as, uh, as uh, competitive in terms of prestige as they are in terms of dollars, you know, and they always have been. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's perfectly feasible in terms of human beings. Somebody just has to recognize its importance and allocate the resources because it pays you back, you know, uh, it's an, an incredibly productive investment, even if it's not an immediate investment. Well, I would ask, but I think I already know the answer to the question about uh, uh, if you have regrets or whether you would do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have regrets about leaving mathematics, but no regrets about movement disorders. I would do yeah, it again in, in a flash, yeah. especially if I could have Heidi back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't imagine. Well, um, we are almost at the end of our time. I, will, uh, I would like to thank Paul for uh, sharing this with us. And as, <laughs> Ranting. as he knows, uh, he came over to uh, join our group at Mount Sinai two years ago, which was uh, the single most important thing that happened uh, at uh, the institution oh. for me. No, absolutely. Um, and. Uh, one of the great regrets from my fellowship is I didn't get to directly see patients with Paul, but I learned most, if not all, I know about dystonia from Paul. And uh, it's certainly a tremendous privilege to have him uh, with us at Sinai. Uh, and uh, uh, both as a mentor and as a role model for our uh, uh, fellows and trainees. Likewise. So thank you.